Hello. Uh, welcome. Welcome back. Welcome to the next session of today's program, uh, where we'll be talking about application modernization. Uh, so my name is Ben Wilson. I'm a product manager for our modernization products here at Vaden. Uh, about three months ago, my boss asked me very politely, uh, Ben, you will give a presentation about the when and how of application modernization? And I said, sure. So here we are. Uh, application modernization, I think we've heard a lot about this topic the past months and years. So I'd actually like us to get started with um, just getting a bit warmed up to see how many of you in the audience have actually heard a presentation about application modernization in the past three years? Could you raise your hand? I think, I think that's most of it. How many of you have seen at least three presentations about application modernization in the past three years? Uh, still quite a number. Okay, right. Well, um, I know that uh, application modernization is quite a popular topic, and I have been, well, fortunate to have been doing this for quite some time, so I hope uh, that everyone will learn at least one thing uh, today in this session. So very simple, um, the agenda for our talk today is going to be when to modernize and how to modernize. I thought I'd uh, tackle it in that order. But before we dive into uh, the nitty gritty, I wanted to first uh, talk about something uh, that's around us and wondering if we could get inspired by the world around us and some of the magnificent architecture that we have here. If you stand up and look around, you'll see that we are in a magnificent building. <clears throat> the building is called 140 West, and it is 145 meters tall. And I can't help thinking that someone made a mistake somewhere, um, but that's it. The name of the building is 140 West. It's 145 meters tall, and its purpose the purpose of the building is residential, so the people actually living here uh, and uh, there's also a hotel inside uh, this building. Um, so that's, that's cool. Now, if we were to go back in time about 11 years and look at this exact same spot, then we would see something very different. We would see a building that was only 116 meters tall, and nobody lived there. Uh, it was all classrooms. This was uh, the building of the Goethe University, and they actually had classes here. So in the morning, you might have a class on the third floor, and then at 10 o'clock, you might have a class on the 20th floor, and then you might have another class on the fifth floor. So you'd be taking the elevator quite a lot. And this building looks very different from uh, the building that we're in today. So the question is, how did we get from the 116-meter-tall AFE tower to the 145 meter tall 140 west. How did that happen? Well, in February 2014, this happened. Three, two, one. There we go. And it's gone. There goes the AFE tower. So this was the process. First, we had the AFE tower. And then step two was smoke and dust. Step three was a massive hole in the ground. Step four is building a new building on the site. And then step five is uh, the situation that we have today. So the question that you could ask is, is this an example of modernization? And I think most people would agree, and I, I also think so, that this is not really a good example of modernization. What we've done is we've created the situation for a greenfield development to take place. Um, but the question is, can we prove this? Can we prove that what has happened here around the AFE tower and uh, 140 West that this is not an example of modernization. There is a proof uh, that we can do with that, and it's a fun proof because we're in Germany, and the proof is best done 
by using the German language. The proof is the identity test. So we can tell if modernization has taken place by doing the identity test. And it's best to do this in the German language, as I said, because German is one of the few languages that I know where you can answer a yes or no question in three different ways. <laughs> you, have, you have the word for definitely yes, which is ja. You have the word definitely no, which is nein. And then you have this thing that's, well, it is and it isn't. And that is captured by the German word jein. So the way the identity test works is you ask, is the new system the old system? And if you can answer ja, then you know that not enough has changed for this to be considered modernization. If you can answer nein with certainty, then you can also answer that, well, too much modernization, or maybe too many things have changed uh, so that it's no longer recognizable, and then this would also not be considered a modernization. And it's only when you have an answer, or it's only when you have a situation that makes your head hurt, uh, then you can answer yein, and then you do in fact have a situation or an example of modernization. Okay. Remember that, that's going to be, we're gonna come back to the AFE tower in uh, a few minutes. This is going to be uh, a metaphor that we will use about uh, answering the question when to modernize. Let's kick off with actually answering this question. It's actually pretty easy answering this question. So when do you modernize? I think you can modernize when you're ready to modernize. Uh, and how do you know you're ready to modernize? Well, modernization is typically something that you would be undertaking as a project. So this is typically something that would be starting and also ending at a certain point, and resources are going to be allocated uh, for this purpose, uh, for the duration of the project. And there's some things that you're going to need. One, of course, is specifications. Someone needs to say what uh, the new system needs to do. And if you're attacking your modernization with a system of feature parity, it's actually very easy to answer this question because the specifications of what the new system is going to do is going to be exactly the same as uh, what the old system does. You could also have the situation that uh, your application isn't very large and maybe someone in your team just knows exactly what the application needs to do and they go on a vendor and then over the course of uh, maybe two or three weekends, they're able to completely redevelop uh, the system or re-implement it or finish the modernization and they don't have to ask anybody anything. If that's not the case, if you have a, a large application and you're not doing uh, feature parity, then the specifications do have to come from somewhere. So having them uh, is a great place to start. Next thing that you're going to certainly need is domain experts. So someone needs to say when the project is in a state that it can be considered final, uh, finalized and done, uh, that the application does what it's supposed to do, someone who can accept uh, the application. You also need technology experts, of course. I mean, you might need some architecture work to happen. You might uh, need a lot of development to happen. You may need software tools, so things that will help you understand what the existing application is doing or might help you understand how to test uh, the target system. Or perhaps there's even tools that might uh, help you refactor your software throughout the process. Because it's a project, you'll need some people to manage the project and communicate with the users and sponsors. And of course, finally, um, you need someone to say, we are going to finish this, uh, even though uh, we might have other priorities or we might have other things that urgently require our attention, uh, but someone who uh, continues to come back to this project, ensure that it finishes and that uh, the inevitable bumps in the road are addressed. If you have all that, I'd say you're ready to modernize. So that was easy. We've answered that question. But the more interesting question is probably going to be related to this, 
because if you have one application that you need to modernize, you're probably going to have more than one application that you need to modernize. So the question of when to modernize is, well, it's, it's a valid question, but a more interesting question might be the question of how do you pick which application you should modernize first? To answer this question, I'm going to go to the domain of application portfolio management. So if you go to Google Images and you uh, search for application portfolio management, then you're gonna see something that looks like this. It's a bunch of quadrants, 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 and circle, circles, circles in the quadrants. So application portfolio management, it's and it's a domain, I would say, that's been derived from actual portfolio management where people would be trying to understand their portfolio and in particular their assets and the risks that these assets have and the risk that uh, they would not be worth what they would uh, hope to be worth. And we can see <coughs> how a number of uh, companies have tried to do application, port uh, excuse, application portfolio management uh, based off of this. So if we look at some of these, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, read for you. I understand that it's hard to read. It's a bit hard for me to read as well. Uh, but here in this first one of, of the six, we have technology fit and business value. The second one, we have importance to the organization and strategic alignment versus risks. In this third one, we have business fit and IT fit. In this fourth one, we have enterprise architecture score and business value score. On the fifth one over here, we've got TV, BV. I guess, I guess they mean uh, technical value, business value. Probably that's, that's what they're getting at there. And then, uh, the sixth one over here is technical fit and functional fit. So you could ask, well, is there a right way to do this? I would say these examples demonstrate no. <laughs> there is not one right way to do this. There's many different ways of doing this. Um, but some of these ways are probably going to be more useful than others. I would think, uh, in particular, any um, application portfolio management practice that is trying to analyze the portfolio by fit with the business versus fit with IT um, isn't really helping uh, companies that much to understand how to move forward uh, because these are not exactly orthogonal concepts. I mean, we would expect that the business strategy and the IT strategy would be a little bit aligned, right? Otherwise, we, we've got bigger problems. Um, but this isn't like the year 1980 where we had business and IT as, as completely separate uh, concepts. Um, nowadays, you know, we, uh, business is, is so digital, uh, we would be expecting business fit and IT fit uh, to be very overlapping. So I would, I would say probably business fit and IT fit, uh, probably not a good way of doing that. <clears throat> what I'm showing here next is a, um, some results from a survey that we recently did of companies that have swing applications, and we asked them, what are the biggest challenges you face with your swing applications? And uh, some of the answers that they selected, or many of the answers that they selected, I think it's not possible to say that these are purely business-related or purely IT-related. Uh, having an application that is not web-enabled, I mean, there are uh, business reasons and IT reasons uh, why uh, this would be a good thing to address uh, if you still have a desktop application. This is top down. If we look at it bottom up, well, there's other questions that we also asked the Swing uh, community, and we asked the developers, if you had a magic wand and could change anything about your Swing application, uh, what would be things that you would change? And some of the answers were quite interesting, but many of them were related to we would stop using certain things and we would start using other things. Like we would start using OAuth 
and we would start using Spring Boot, and we would stop using JXplorer, and we would start using Docker, and we would start using the latest Java version, and we would stop using a SQL database and start using MicroStream. So here also we see, and, and it goes on this list, uh, but here we also see that even from a bottom-up um, perspective, there's uh, things that are not purely non-functional uh, that are related to uh, these choices. So instead of looking for business fit and IT fit, I think a better way of looking at this would be to look for functional fit to the business and non-functional fit to the business, uh, and assuming that the business and the IT strategies are aligned. There are a number of companies that also see things this way. Uh, one is the company RDoc, and they recently uh, posted something on their website where they did an application portfolio management of the entire portfolio of a mid-sized company. And here you can see displayed, they have over 100 applications in their organization, and they have all graded the applications according to the functional fit and the non-functional fit, and all these little circles, they fit into different quadrants in this uh, chart. So we could be looking at this chart and we have no idea what company this is. We don't know what country they're located in. We don't know what industry they're in necessarily. But simply by looking at this chart, we can see that this company has some serious issues that it needs to tackle. Uh, one of them, uh, most importantly, is that all the way at the bottom of uh, this chart, there are many applications that are shown as having a poor non-functional fit. These could be applications that have uh, all kinds of problems. There could be security problems related to this. There could be problems with data integrity. They might have no one uh, that they can find who wants to work with the technology uh, that these applications were built upon. Uh, we, we don't know. So certainly anything that is all the way at the bottom would be something that uh, this company would probably prioritize when it comes to modernization. At the same time, if we look at <laughs> this side, that side of, uh, of the chart, then we'll see that there are also some, not many, but quite a few of applications that are shown as not having a good functional fit. And these would be applications uh, that aren't necessarily, that they, they, they might be written with uh, you know, the latest technology, but they're not actually uh, fitting the business and they might be slowing the business down from evolving. Uh, so that would also be very problematic. So I think many of you are probably looking at this chart and you're saying, oh my God, this is so complicated. Um, my organization doesn't have that many applications, so we, we probably can't do anything with this. Um, so even, so I, I just want to say that even if you have a small number of applications, there are some principles from application portfolio management that you can actually use in order to uh, help you communicate within your organization and also uh, to help communicate about the decisions that you're making around how you are modernizing your applications. One of them is, of course, uh, prioritization, but another important one is the text that you can certainly can't see uh, because of the uh, 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 contrast of the screens up there, but in very fine gray uh, text, there's something showing on this, which is coming from Gartner's time model. So application portfolio management will also link your applications to uh, the right application portfolio level uh, actions that you might want to take with your applications and uh, which ones would be the most appropriate. So Gartner is a company that has uh, come up with one certain model and that is the time model and that's really standing for uh, the first letters of the words tolerate, invest, migrate, eliminate and uh, that is depending on if the applications have a low or high non-functional fit or a low or high functional fit. Now, these are not verbs that you typically use with your developers, right? 
You don't go to your developers and say, developer, this quarter, your objective is to tolerate the CRM application. This, this isn't the, it, this isn't the, the developer-friendly vocabulary. So Gartner has helped translate these portfolio-related uh, terms to developer-friendly terms, and this is how uh, they've extended that. So tolerate becomes re-engineer, invest becomes innovate and evolve, modernize, well, migrate becomes modernize, and eliminate becomes replace and consolidate. Uh, there we go. So, getting back to our, our three German words that we learned today. The top here is probably going to be your ja. The bottom right is going to be your jein. And the bottom left is going to be your nein. So what you would expect to happen once you've put a new application into production and you started using it would be that, well, in the beginning, the application would have a high functional fit and it would also have a, a high non-functional fit. And then if you put this into production and don't touch it anymore, uh, then gradually you would expect that the fitness of this application would start degrading uh, both on the functional and the non-functional side. And uh, this is going to continue. Um, and you're going to reach a certain point that you're going to start crossing over into this quadrant that's low and low. And if you don't do anything, then gradually your users are going to start hating the application. They're going to hate it. And they're going to hate it more and more as you get closer to this bottom corner. And at a certain point, they will hate it so much that they will want to destroy the application in a cloud of dust like the AFE tower in Frankfurt. There we go. So we obviously don't want that. Um, so um, what are we doing then? Uh, so the answer to this, to keep our applications from landing in the garbage can, uh, what we do is, of course, do regular modernization and maintenance. Uh, this can be continuous. It doesn't have to be continuous, but it can be continuous. But certainly one way to prevent uh, the crossing over into this uh, lower quadrant is to do a regular assessment. You want to assess your applications on a regular basis to make sure that uh, they're not slipping too far, or you also want to assess to see uh, how quickly, perhaps, the applications are moving and how quickly the fitness of the applications are degrading over time. How often should you do that? Um, that's really up to you. I would suggest if this is something that you're not doing and you might be interested in uh, playing with this and trying this out, that you might want to try to do this once a quarter. You might want to try once a quarter to see how is the functional and non-functional fitness of the application? Is this suddenly moving more quickly than it has in the past? And what corrective uh, actions should we take? OK, that was uh, what I wanted to say about uh, when to modernize. Next, we're going to go into how to modernize. So the, the first thing, unfortunately, that I have to say is, well, we, we just need to recognize that there is no best practice for modernization. Um, Gartner, you know, Gartner has these things called magic quadrants. And uh, I, I've got the list of all the magic quadrants that Gartner has. So let, let's read some of them. They have integrated risk management solutions. They have integration platform as a service worldwide. They have intrusion detection and prevention systems. They have IT service management platforms. And they have this, this huge list of uh, industries and solutions uh, that they're tracking in order to see what are the vendors that are in this space 
so that they can uh, order them in a certain way and present who's leaders, who's challengers, and so forth. So Gartner has all of these uh, uh, magic quadrants, but it doesn't have a magic quadrant for modernization. There is no magic quadrant for application modernization that you can see uh, at, at Gartner's uh, research. You also won't find a best practice from Gartner on how to modernize. Uh, they actually give you seven ways of modernizing. And these are the, uh, the best practices uh, that they're saying because they've seen these seven different approaches uh, being implemented in a com by companies successfully. And the reason for this is really clear. So, um, you know, big bang or phased, uh, it depends. I talk to a lot of companies that are uh, planning a phased migration and they have very good reasons for that. I talk to companies that want to do this in a big bang way and they have very good reasons for that and uh, that's fine. Uh, another uh, dimension would be the feature parity or changing features. Would you bother users? Do users want you to not bother them because they're too busy making money to talk to you people in IT? Or are your users really active and want to work with you and demand to see what it is that you're working on so that they can have a say in uh, what's happening? That depends. It depends on the culture of uh, your company. Build or buy. Uh, that, there's reasons why that would depend as well. So there's quite a number of reasons why uh, there there is no best practice and there really can't be a best practice uh, around modernization. But what we can do is explore the practices that work. And uh, once again, I'm going back to Gartner. I'm sorry for doing that so much, but they just seem to make sense. And there's a lot of research also. So um, seminars, you'll notice one of these doesn't start with the letter R. But D don't worry about that. They were supposed to, they started with five R's and then they added two and one of them just didn't start with R. I don't know, it's just. <clears throat> okay, so we have encapsulate, rehost, replatform, refactor, rearchitect, and then rebuild and replace. We can categorize these, we can lump these together into three general uh, categories. We can say that encapsulate and rehost, this is about wrapping the app. Uh, we can say that replatform, refactor, rearchitect, this is about changing the app, or we could say transform the app, and then with rebuild and replace, we're throwing the app away. Uh, let's, let's look at these uh, just for a sec. Um, so encapsulate. Um, actually, it's very interesting. I think that encapsulate uh, is, is at the top of the list, but it's also one of the things that I've seen a lot of uh, people talking about in the past years. Um, and you probably have heard about something called the strangler pattern. So the strangler pattern is where you basically, you take the software that you want to modernize and you say, nobody touch it, nobody touch it. We're not going to change it. We're not going to move it. We're going to leave it there, but we're going to add things around it. And then our software, instead of working with this, uh, uh, the, the software that we're trying to modernize, we're going to uh, deal with what we've created in order to encapsulate that, and then gradually we will move the functionality from the application and uh, away, and then we won't depend on it anymore, and we can safely remove it from our, uh, our, our, our application or our, our network. Uh, so I've seen that re reference a lot uh, as companies are looking for ways to uh, convert monoliths to microservices. Uh, so that's been interesting to see uh, how that's been uh, promoted. Uh, Rehost is s similar, uh, but it's taking the application and it is moving it somewhere else and then having something like a, an emulator around it in order to make that possible. Uh, the refactor and replatform, these are very similar. I won't go into the nuances, but uh, we are changing the application. The architect is interesting because uh, what this is doing is it's taking an application uh, that is working in a, a certain uh, technical context and then we're changing the application to make it as compatible as possible with its current context and a new context as well. So we are in effect retrofitting the replatforming changes that, that, that we can implement in order to move uh, the, uh, the application's dependencies to a different a set of libraries and uh, have minimal impact 
uh, as we step across and remove uh, the dependencies on whatever it is that we were depending on before. And then finally, rebuild and replace. Uh, this is throwing the app away, saying, yeah, the only way to make the app better is to throw it in the garbage. And um, basically, you're addressing that with a build or buy situation and uh, creating something from scratch. All right, so I hope everybody's forgotten my previous metaphor uh, of the AFE tower. We now have a new metaphor that I'm going to use, which is facial treatments. All right, so uh, let's say we want to look beautiful. Okay, what can we do? We can put face cream on our face, we can get Botox injections, and we can get plastic surgery. Fantastic. All right, so <clears throat> if we look at these three um, things that we can do, <laughs> Um, we can order them by invasiveness. And we can say that uh, Botox is going to be more invasive than the face cream, and plastic surgery is going to be more invasive than the Botox. Uh, the impact is rising together with the in invasiveness, but so is also the effort, the cost, the complexity, and the risk. Now that we have that, we can see well, what are sort of the properties of these different solutions. Well, with face cream, we can say nothing has changed actually to the face. Uh, whatever we've done, it's just a superficial only uh, that's been happened. And uh, with Botox, we have padding added to better fill the requirements, which is a wrinkle-free face. Uh, we're not really taking anything away at this point. And then finally, plastic surgery. Well, we are really changing things, uh, but we need to ex accept that people who knew us before may no longer recognize us. And that's the whole idea. Now we can overlay on this uh, facial <laughs> treatment uh, spectrum, uh, we can put the Gartner's invasiveness spectrum. We can put encapsulate, rehost, replatform, rearchitect, rebuild and replace. And these descriptions are going to fit pretty well, especially uh, on the two extremes, uh, encapsulate uh, and rehost. Really, nothing is changed, and what we're changing is just the periphery and anything that's superficial. With rebuild and replace, yes, we are absolutely removing things, and we're absolutely adding things, and uh, it could be that we need to retrain our users uh, when we're done. Okay, so if we're making a decision about what facial treatment we're going to take. Uh, there's all sorts of reasons why we might choose one or the other. Um, but if we're in an enterprise situation, then we need to choose which of the seven R's is going to be useful for our organization. Then we make the decision somewhat more differently. We would expect to make a cost-effective so, uh, decision. We would expect to make a decision about which solution is the most cost effective for our organization. And to know about cost effectiveness, we need a trade-off. We need to be able to trade something off, and we don't really see that in this picture, what might be traded off. So let's try to go and find that. All right. Invasiveness really increases at the same time as the extra cost of leveraging technologies and features from the current application increases. So if you have certain things that your uh, current application does that isn't really possible in the new technology perhaps that you might be uh, looking at, um, then the extra cost of leveraging those features is going to increase as you become more invasive. And of course, you know what the trade-off is, uh, wh where I'm heading with this. The trade-off is, of course, going to be uh, the extra cost of leveraging new technologies and features. So it's easier to use new technologies and features in the target application if you're using a more invasive uh, a process than if you're using a less invasive process. So of course, if you're doing both, if you're interested in leveraging the existing features of your application uh, because they work and they're valuable, 
But at the same time, you want to have the world open for being able to uh, do uh, new things and, and, and to uh, take advantage of uh, the new uh, platforms and technologies, then you're going to be looking at something like this. So where does cost effective, so where does cost effectiveness come into play here? Um, I see this as, well, if you are not really interested in the new technologies, and some companies aren't in some situations, they're totally fine with the way the application works and the way that users are interacting with the application, then you're not going to see the yellow line. You're not going to see the blue line. The only line you're going to see is the green line, and then it's obvious what the most cost-effective decision, or the most uh, cost-effective option is going to be. On the other hand, let's suppose, you know, this old stuff, uh, we don't want to know about it anymore, let's build new stuff, and we're interested in uh, newer technologies, turning away from the past, then you're not going to see the green line. You're not going to see the blue line. The only line that you're going to see is the yellow line. And then it's obvious what the most cost-effective uh, approach is going to be. That's rebuild and replace. But if you're in a situation where uh, you see that there is value in your existing application, but there's also value in the ability to innovate uh, in the future using newer technologies, then you're going to try to combine that. You're going to be seeing all of these lines at once, and then uh, the most cost-effective solution is going to be anything in the middle where we're, we're leveraging the application that exists as much as we can. Okay, uh, that was what I wanted to say about cost-effectiveness. Let's see how we can stretch this metaphor a little bit more and see what we can learn about uh, these different uh, approaches. So I'm going to stretch the metaphor with uh, facial treatments in three ways. First, let's look at applicability. I think the metaphor holds very well uh, in the situation for uh, facial treatments and application modernization approaches when it comes to applicability. If you consider, let's take the face first, right? So I could take face cream and I would probably put it all over my face. That's how face cream works. But because I would put face cream all over my face, it doesn't mean that I would get plastic surgery all over my face. And uh, I think this analogy holds for application modernization because encapsulation and rehosting, this really does work very well for taking entire applications, uh, for example, uh, desktop applications and moving them to web, or web applications or on-prem applications and moving them to the cloud. Um, they, they simply work this way. This is your, your lift and shift, and it's easier to lift the thing in its entirety. However, you might look at your application and you might see that there's different views in your application. Some views are used by many people or most people, or there's a large number of users that are using certain views, but there's certain views that are not being used by a large number of uh, users. You might have a handful of users that use some administrative uh, 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 views, perhaps. And then you can ask the question, well, it might be, or there might be a, a, a business case for aggressively modernizing the views that, men, that have many users that are being used uh, intensively, uh, but that same case doesn't exist for views that are being used uh, less frequently. That's the first way that we can stretch the metaphor, and I think it holds. We're going to break the metaphor now uh, by looking at ordering. So I'm certainly not a face expert, um, and, uh, but I, I think it's perfectly fine to put face cream all over your face and then two months later to have some plastic surgery. I think that's fine, that order of doing things. I also think it's possible to have some plastic surgery today and then two months from now put some uh, face cream on your face. I, I think that probably works. I, I, I don't see any uh, issue with that. However, uh, when we go to look at uh, the, uh, the, the, the world of uh, application modernization, ordering does become important uh, because once you've done 
something to a certain level of invasiveness, the uh, other approaches that come before become obsolete. So doing a rehosting first, and then later doing some replatforming of certain elements of the rehosted application, this makes sense. And you can do that. But if you replatform your entire application, then it, may, it makes absolutely no sense to try to rehost that uh, as a separate uh, subsequent step. And then the last one is about the scarcity of the tooling. Um, so, right, for our, our face uh, metaphor, uh, I think there's many thousands, if not millions, of bottles of face cream that you can buy that are just sitting there in the world, but we don't have that the same number of uh, plastic surgeons. Um, so uh, it's very clear that uh, towards, the, towards that end, um, no, towards that end of the uh, uh, spectrum uh, that there is increasing scarcity. But that isn't necessarily the case uh, with uh, modernization because uh, encapsulation and certainly with rehosting, rehosting tends to be uh, emulation. So this tends to be actual emulators uh, that are emulating sometimes a very large runtime uh, in another, uh, well, in, in another context. Uh, there's a significant cost involved in creating a rehosting tool uh, that would be generally usable. And they, these can sometimes be very scarce. So that would actually constrain your ability to do rehosting if, um, there, if, if there is no tool available, then uh, right, then, then that particular rehosting that you're trying to do won't be possible. On the other hand, yeah, you know, rebuilding your application, uh, I think that's certainly an option that many companies have already tried, uh, and you don't actually need necessarily a large number of rare tools in order to rebuild an application if you're rebuilding it from scratch. Okay, uh, let's see. All right, okay, so here's an example. All right, here's an example. So in the swing space, because we were talking about swing a bit earlier, there's certainly a number of uh, companies that are considering modernizing their swing applications with Java. So modernizing Java with Java, and that makes a lot of sense. So they have the option. Um, there's a company, if, if you're an organization that has swing, you've probably done a Google search, and you probably know that there's a company out there called WebSwing, and there's also a company out there called Vaadin, and, uh, but the solutions that they're offering are, are very different. Uh, so with WebSwing, this is very much something that I would place in the rehosting category. Uh, I, I think if WebSwing happened to be here, they would agree with me. And with Vaadin, this is more of a replatforming because uh, what is, uh, offered here with, with Vaadin, it's more at the component level. So there would be some modifications of the source code. If you want to port a swing code to, to Vaadin code, then there is some uh, change that you would need to do to your uh, APIs, to, to your sources. Uh, and uh, this would be really done at the level of Vaadin. So uh, actually, uh, two weeks ago, the company WebSwing posted on the directory, the add-on directory of Vaadin, they posted a, uh, a plugin uh, that allows uh, the running of a WebSwing application then to include Vaadin views. Uh, so this is an example of how you would uh, do this in a phased approach, a phased approach for uh, modernizing where you could first do a rehosting of the entire application and then specifically for those areas of the application where a replatforming would be useful, uh, then you could do the replatforming to Vaadin. Uh, right, that's it. And then, yeah, Salesforce is over here. I just had to choose something, right? Could be SAP as well. You can always replace that uh, with something else. Uh, but this is what I wanted to share with you. I think we're pretty much out of time. We might have a time for one question, um, but otherwise, is there a question? If not, then, oh, is there a question? 
All right, if there's no question, then I would say uh, thank you. All right, then uh, that's it for this presentation.